Um, it's it's quite unusual to have a day dedicated to water. So it's a it's a it's a wonderful feeling. Okay, and I know I uh, sort of uh, shared a questionnaire, and some of you answered it. I got about 20, 30 responses, <coughs> and uh, it's something I've given to over a thousand people now. And it's quite illuminating what it goes out. Uh, but one of the, some of the findings I've shared with you today, and I've clubbed it with, uh, I will put on the uh, I've clubbed it with the results from, you know, some of the other questionnaires I've given this year. So you, it's not just a self-selected group that you see, but it's a larger group that you see, and I've worked out the selections. But one thing which I wanted to say is one of the questions was how much do you think you know of climate change? And uh, about half of you had said little to moderate. So why don't we start this? And um, um, we'll try to get on the uh, same page of climate change so that's where we we'll start off with. So what you're going to see, uh, what you're going to see first is a video. Um, we're going to enter the video works. That's why I didn't send it, I think, because this video will do half my job for me. Um, what you're going to see is the temperature differences over the last 40 years. Okay. And we're going to see decadal cha te temperature changes. I won't go into the details, but blue is cool. Yellow is about moderate. Orange is warm and red is hot. So um, with that, we'll just start. Okay. So this is the... 1890s, this is the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 2000s, and that's up to 2017. Wow, can you just play that again? So okay, blue is cool. It, it, okay, it's reference to a, a base period. So, but for simplicity, blue is cool. Um, yellow is almost normal and um, it's too is pretty hot and that's today okay so we're about a degree to a degree and a half warmer now right and um, so naturally I think this this is all I mean this is the main thrust of climate change and uh, what I this is a question I asked, which is, who do you think will be most affected by climate change? So the, the blue um, line is future generations. Okay, the light blue line is the whole world. And the pink bar is uh, everyone, everywhere, equally. Okay, and it's really amazing. I've given this um, questionnaire to students, to older people, to you know, people focused in sustainability like yourselves. Uh, to everyday, uh, you know, Rotarians, etc. The answers have been consistent, right? So people think climate change is a problem that affects future generations or everyone, everywhere, equally. And that's a lie, okay? Climate change is the most unequal force that we've seen. And here's another chart, okay? This... Uh, the x-axis is coverage from climate risks. It tells you, it's sort of, if you're closer to the zero point or two in this case, it means you're more exposed to climate risks, okay? And uh, the y-axis is how well you're able to respond to climate risks, okay? And if you look at India, um, we're hit both ways. We're one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, and we don't have a lot of fiscal and you know, political space to respond. And that's the thing. If you were Canada, we would have be having a completely different conversation. If you were, I mean, I, I realized Europe is more vulnerable than uh, anyone thought they were, but India is really vulnerable. And the other few countries there are our neighbors, which doesn't put us in a great place. So what, what makes India so vulnerable uh, to climate change? Anyone? Hmm? Sorry? Glaciers. Yeah, no, 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 not glaciers. Glaciers is part of it, but what, what are glaciers made of? We are rain. Okay, what is rain made of? So water, basically. Water, water. yeah, water, right? Um, 
India asks a fifth of the world's population to basically do with the 3% of the world's freshwater resources. This is an interesting photograph that we took in my institute. What you see is the dry uh, riverbed of the Vaigai. Okay, this was taken during the last El Nino. And what you see are, is a water tanker where women are lining up to gather water. And I think that really uh, presents, uh, we drove past that, I think, when you came to Madurai, you know, and that sort of gives you an idea of uh, India's water predicament. So what I've put here is the decadal incidence of floods, landslides, and storms, and the damages. And I think this is something we can all relate to. You know, about 100 years ago, it wasn't that common. But now it's a given. It's a given every monsoon that, you know, by May, you will have a drought. And by uh, June, Assam will flood. July, some other part of India will flood. And by August, somebody else will flood. And if it's an IOD positive year, like this year promises to be, winter Midras is sort of uh, girding their loins because they're going to flood anywhere. And here's the thing that most people don't get, right? Most of you are sustainability professionals, yes? Everybody, it's so much easier if your job involved redu reducing carbon, right? Your donors would be fine. Your selling pitch would be fine. I reduce carbon, I'm golden. But when we talk of water or adaptation, until recently, and that's why I'm so glad we have a day dedicated to water today, it becomes a more of an uphill task. And that's the second part of climate change that I think is underappreciated. There is something called climate inertia. So if you shut down all emissions today, every coal plant, every car, however unrealistic, shut down every industry, the world will still continue to warm. Okay, And that just means this chart is, is not going to change. It's not going to come down. If anything, it's going to get worse. Right. And that's why this day, this session, you know, what he's accomplished, what we're going to look about today becomes so important because you have to start managing water because all of us who talk climate talk in carbon, but the climate itself talks through water. So that's why water. So the, that's the first part of my speak. Why water? Uh, that's what we spend some time understanding. But who solves the water problem? Okay. And every time I've come up with this, the first almost shorthand response is the government should solve the water. I, yeah, everybody just says policy. So um, I run a tiny institute. You've seen some of the work that we do. Um, Amit was in Chennai launching the report. So one of the things we do is we go and talk to people and study the ground reality. Because one of the problems of those of us working in water know that there is not enough data, right? And one of the questions we asked people, and one of the questions I asked you is, would you vote on water, right? Would water influence your vote? Um, so in the, you know, this is a more educated audience. It's, it's all over the place. And when you see when it's all over the place, you know, it's not a voting issue, right? It's it, it, the elections are too close in India. This this doesn't matter at all. So then we went and asked 947 people, and these are you know well below average income. Uh, you know, these are your auto drivers, your household helps, your petty shopkeeper, and then we went and asked, would you vote on water? And you know, when we asked this question. You remember the time in 2000, I think it was 19, when Leonardo DiCaprio tweeted, only rain can save Chennai. That was when BBC said uh, Chennai had run out of water. In that drought, when most people were getting water once in three or four days, we went and asked this question, would water influence your vote? Broadly, the answer is no. Okay. So, sorry. Candidate needs to vote on the basis of the candidate. Okay. Um, so, and I think this is, I'm going to just very quickly skip ahead to what the spark imagination. This is really something that we need help in to talk about, you know, when we talk of awareness, voting, wanting influences, this is something that in terms of sparking um, imagination, this is something that I wish more people would do. 
is this only unique to Madurai or is this replicable in other cities? Because that really answers a question of if a politician is not going to get rewarded on his policy or his or her policy, not going to make it. Okay. Then, so it's not policy driven, right? So it's not government. They won't take the leadership role. Then this is another question I asked. Should water have a price? No. Okay, and I, um, we'll talk about history a little later. But this, again, across groups, this has been cons consistent. Um, and I'll talk later that it's an it's a anomaly in the history of India that water has never had a price. But we believe, all of us, most of us believe that water shouldn't have a price. The moment you say water doesn't have a price, business steps back. Okay? Uh, you, you're not going to get business to start acting on this to solve the water problem or water management problem. Because if it doesn't have a price, models become harder to create. Um, I'm seeing that in the startups. I'm seeing startup water startups come up. That's unfortunately when people have run out of water. Right? Um, but so if there's no government and it's not business, then who has to solve the water problem? So it's philanthropy and CSR organizations, et cetera, who have to take the lead. I think there is a very, very important role uh, that organizations such as the ones you represent here um, that have to take the lead. Once you take the lead, others will quickly follow. It's not saying that policy doesn't matter. Policy does matter. Business does matter. Okay, but who takes the lead? Who sticks their neck out? So now we'll come to what. So I said, why? Why water? It's because climate speaks in the language of water. And, you know, some of the climate change has already been baked in. So you saw that steep thing of flood. See, drought also is going the same direction. Um, sometimes the same city has drought and flood in the same year. Chennai is an uh, upstanding example of that. Uh, Bangalore is not far behind. Uh, so, and um, who, I gave you some, um, uh, some data on, you know, why it's unlikely we'll get the kind of policy drive and the push, um, you know, something like MNREGA will have a lot of policy and government support. They will take the lead, right? Because it's, it's jobs, it's counter seasonal jobs. It, it's got a good political salience. They'll take the lead. Water doesn't have a price in most of India. Um, most of you feel water shouldn't have a price. So that's not something politicians are going to stick their neck out and say, I'm going to put it. Um, they may put it on paper. They won't implement it. That means business and you know financial reasons for managing doesn't is not the who. So it's really philanthropy need, that needs to stick their neck out. And it's a, it's a problem. It's, it's a burning problem, right? I didn't know much about water until I ran out of it at home. And then you realize, you know, it's invisible until it un, until it's gone. And then it really says, you know, it speaks by its absence. So now let's come to what. Um, in the what, uh, I'm really going to go to your questions. Some of it are. So one thing, um, and I'm sorry, this slide is not coming up. I don't know why. But the one thing that I want to say is most people haven't visited their nearest water body. Even people who, in this group, they said, where is my nearest water body? So I think the case becomes really, really uh, uh, pertinent. Um, see, because I think we're going to talk about culture and uh, cultural aspects of water body and history later. You know, earlier, life revolved around water bodies. Baulis were places where people got together to socialize. Right, that's where you hung out, you caught up on your gossip. What your office, uh, you know, uh, it's you no longer have your coffee stand or your water. When I went to college, that was when people caught up, etc. That's your that was your bowling. Today, it's it's not it's gone away. Most people don't even think it's a nuisance. Most people may have their flat built on their bowling or their office built on their bowling. Definitely, the local corporation office will be built on a lake. Huh? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Madre is uh, the corporation office is built there. T Nagar. Okay, any of you guys from Madras? Chennai? Yeah. T Nagar was a big lake. It was two miles by three miles. The Madras Sport Club had their uh, winter regatta there. It was that big. 
and they built over it in in the last hundred years. Um, and then we ask, why is it flooding? Well, it's it's a lake, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and uh, yeah. Anyway, the this is really an interesting point. Okay, I um, there was a question that uh, asked people, do you know about sewage treatment? Pretty much everyone said they knew about sewage treatment. Then there was a question in my in there that said, uh, what is the first word that comes up? I expected yuck, gross, horrible, this, that. People were quite, either they were virtue signaling and anonymously or, uh, you know, they were quite honest about it. They said, yes, it's great. It's visionary, this, that, and all. They're quite, quite open to it. But then there's a paradox here. Right. I argue in my book, this comes down to water not having a price, so it doesn't make sense, especially in, I take the case study of Bangalore in my book. But this is something that, you know, philanthropy uh, or CSR can start looking into, making the case for a, um, a, you know, more sewage treatment. Because once you get sewage treatment in, you've solved a large part of the urban water problem. Then there's another thing. People, how much water do you use per day? I'm not going to ask you how much you use, but how do you think people will know or not know the answer to this? Right. Uh, just one question. How many of you have a meter in your house? What a meter in your house? Yeah. How many of you have a water meter in your house? Yeah, everything is. Okay, about 20 to 30 yeah, percent. Yeah, no, no, but flats, it's coming up. See, the thing is, when we ran out of water at home, uh, I realized I had no clue where I was using my water. So today we have 15 meters in our house. There's a little bit of OCD in there, but uh, that really tells me where I'm using my water and where I can put my finger on at any point in time to understand where to get it done. Um, the other thing that I want to say is water is not in our curriculum, guys. I want to say like, you know, we study the Ganga, Yamuna, whatever, but it's not there in a way that it hits you in your stomach and makes you want to act. Um, in uh, a few years ago, I'd come to, and this is, I'm going to shut down here and then uh, a few years ago, I came to Bangi for a water. Orissa school teacher. He's a Gaum school teacher. And his uh, contention, which I found very interesting, is he teaches all his uh, class six and seven students, maths, physics, chemistry, everything, using local water examples. It's really cool. It's not difficult to do. And everything he frames that way. And he says when the children learn local things, right, action starts happening. And I think, you know, one thing we're going to start talking about, I think, through the day, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, is community. I think the community becomes really, really critical when you want to um, manage rural water bodies, definitely. But in some sense, urban water bodies also. Okay, because in urban water bodies, I think all of us know that water bodies are, you know, they've mostly disappeared. Some of them are still there. And with land prices going through the roof, there is a very, very good incentive for the water body to disappear. And unless the local communities, you know, it's not a community, right? It's just a neighborhood of people. If they don't step up, um, uh, you know, they're not going to think. There's one data point I want to talk about. Again, it goes back to curriculum education. Um, uh, it's not there, but it's in our study and our study is available on our website. So we studied about 100 water bodies, some of it in conjunction with uh, A.T. Chandra also. Um, we crowdsource groundwater depths across 100 water bodies at different depths to ask the question, what makes water bodies functional? Right? And uh, then we also, we've spoken to about uh, 2,000 plus households over the last five years, looking at water realities. That water survey was only one of... Uh, the questions we ask. So one of the questions we ask is how much uh, do you buy water? And by the way, most of you uh, had a bought tanker water last month, last six months. Um, we ask, do you buy water? And then we ask, how much do you spend per month buying water? So even in a lower middle class uh, 
group that we surveyed, the average water spend was around 400 to 500 rupees a month, which is a lot of money, right? But what is very interesting is when people lived next to a functional water body, they saved about 100, water, 100 rupees per month in buying water. Now, if you communicate that, right, and I'm not getting into the cultural aspects very mm -hmm. thing, if you communicate that, um, if you can replicate this survey, it's not very difficult to do. And if you can replicate and communicate that, don't form a community unless there is something in it for them, right? I think uh, in your case study, I mean, I've seen various versions over time. There's something really that the community gets away from having a functional water body. Um, because water is really a multiplier. I think that was mentioned there. In, in the urban context, we really have to look hard. And one of the reasons, one of the things we found is um, they can save money. So I'll, there's one last point and then I'll stop. I actually am much more involved in climate tech startups, right? And water is a focus area. Uh, it's, that's what makes, uh, makes me excited. That's what I come across. And when we look at climate tech startups, one of the things we look at is a blend of capital. It's a range of capital. So uh, you look at debt, you look at equity. If you look at the risky risk profile of the capital, I would urge you, to think of the money that you're spending as the riskiest capital available in the pot. Okay. So what I would urge philanthropy and CSR programs to do is to really experiment. Because look, at some level, and this is, comes from my work and my experience in startups, we really don't know what's going to work at a particular context. We don't, unless we go out and try. And philanthropic capital, CSR capital, is the riskiest capital. And, you know, given the realities, the political and the economic realities of water in India, I would really urge you to go out and experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madhu. I'll take three questions and then we move to the first case. Yeah. So if we have any questions at this point. Is there any model of the world where so I will go to Indian history. Okay, if you look at the Arthashastra, Shastra, the Arthashastra Shastra talks beautifully about the pricing of water. He gives tax breaks for uh, water body maintenance, right? Um, it's it's really interesting when you look at the fines and the water charges that the Arthashastra Shastra puts. But let's, I think philosophically today, who is uh, following the Arthashastra? Shastra? Singapore and Israel. Right. Um, I've got the full details in my book. I think I've also written about it in a pre article somewhere. So. Um, but the the premise is this, right? The basic minimum is at the lowest cost. Right. So what a family of four say uses um in a month, if they if they're not having pools and whatever, is you can either make it free. That's what Delhi tried to do. They said X amount is free. And then you, even if you go a little above that, you get charged. So uh, thing, and then you do volumetric pricing, which increases. So the second slab is a slightly above and the third slab is there. What uh, Israel adds, which is very interesting, is uh, different qualities of water are charged differently. So uh, if you use real sewage, I think Bangalore is doing that also, to not full level, but you can buy uh, reused, uh, retreated sewage at a cheaper price. And that makes sense. Uh, yeah, for the industries, even uh, domestic, one study I thought, you no, know, near that Belandur, um, because somebody sent me an advertising pamphlet of the Belandur thing. And then I spoke to a couple of apartments. So there is a, there's treated sewage. But what is very important is what if water is fixed? So what, um, um, Israel does is it makes farmers pay the cheapest amount for water, but their um, their their quantum is fixed based on the rainfall of a particular year. Right. So there is various ways to think about. I would think of equity. I actually think for India, uh, something that makes a lot of sense is seasonality. We have one of the most seasonal waters in the world. Right. 
So we most of our rainfall falls in about 75 hours, less than 100 hours. 75% falls less than 100 hours. So, you know, make it free during the monsoon, but price it during the summer. Yes. That's your job. That's really sparking imagination. That's your job. Uh, see, I think it's it's going to be a really uphill task um, because, you know, we asked that question in the middle of a drought. People who are getting water once in four days didn't say they would vote on water. So I don't want to give you a flip answer and say, thing. but if ever water was going to become an election issue, it will be in the aftermath of the drought. So don't talk to them when the monsoon is like flooding down and their thing is, but when it's, it's an El Nino year this year, I mean, all this feels like me, there's no rain. This is not a bad time to start talking. It will get worse if they say it's free. In royal free one. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. They won't vote for it. Okay. It, it's something we talk about, but that's what we went and asked. Even the 12% who said they'll vote on water said they'll vote for a water connection. One person in 947 people said he'll vote for a person who diesel did tax. And that's what he told us. Okay. One last question here. Sir. Okay, two questions and then question I just want to tell you water is uh, a voting agenda still in India because long back uh, promising free water for the farmers, whatever their demand is there. I, uh, I've gone through the history of Punjab, Gujarat, no, even, even, even in uh, Andhra Pradesh and the, your uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, it is, it is there because free water has been provided. Oh, if you and, if uh, without, comes in, they they the the they vote for you, but without estimating my and a farmer without estimating my department, I have been provided a free access to groundwater and I have been exploring and everything with for us. And now even in Odisha commercialization has been started. In, there are small villages, Odisha is one of the state, which are the many small villages are. Yeah, where even in the next decade, water is not going. So that the private persons put their goodwill and collect money from the Yeah, I, I, I think what Vidula is saying is there is no voting issue to reduce usage. Yes, the but voting issues are to give more yeah. water, which is the issue. Yeah. Not Fair. management of water, but even provision is a is a yeah. is a one last question. Yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the point related to voting and the pricing part here. So, you know, endeavor to educate people about the water and the savings and other things. We are somehow not bringing up the quality related aspect. Wouldn't that throw more light on people, demand better quality water for a better price? Wouldn't that create some kind of work? Okay, I, um, I haven't put that up there. We asked that question. Mm -hmm. So, we asked people, if you got 24 by 7 water on tap, good quality coming into your doorstep, would you pay for it? Most people said no. However, I some of you, many of you may already know the case study of Malkapur. How many people know Malkapur? Yeah, one person said yes. No, I, I would urge you to go and see it. Uh, if you, I've written about it uh, in the thing I spoke to different constituencies there. They actually got, uh, it's a very interesting uh, example of how civil society and politics work hand in hand to get 24, exactly all the pricing that I said, uh, metered, 100% metering, volumetric pricing, you know, the bulk users play more, and it's a small village, right, in Maharashtra. The, the trick there is it's a safe seat for a politician. So he could afford to experiment because there's no political competition, and he could afford to Go step by step. So actually, uh, the two by two matrix that I would talk about is, please focus on what are stressed, what are high risk districts in India. And I think that's, that's a fairly easy thing. And focus on districts which have low political competition. These are the safe seats. If you put your message there and then say, um, Let's talk about it. Malkapur is a great example of how that happened. And before all of you think this is all BS, I've seen this done in solid waste. And so, I mean, my institute actually focuses on waste and water. 
waste is actually moving forward far faster than solid waste management is moving far faster than water. So it has worked there. Yeah. So how is that spelled for the village? Malkapur. M A L K A P U R. Okay. Thank you, Midula.